All right, you're on camera now, John. Okay. <laughs> All right, action. He's an American independent film director, screenwriter, actor, and novelist. He's twice been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for Passion Fish in 1992 and Lone Star in 1996. Both of those films he directed, most of those films he does direct. He also penned and directed some real doozies, including my favorite, Eight Men Out, which uh, unfortunately our friend Perry Lang couldn't be with us, yeah. so we're filming him. I'm the president of this fan club. Just so, you know. <laughs> so shout out to Perry Lang on YouTube. Anyway, lesser known, though, is the fact that before he wrote screenplays, John was a novelist. 1975, it started with Pride of the Bimbos, which I'm dying to read after reading that. <laughs> Since then, he's written five more novels, including A Moment in the Sun in 2011 and Yellow Earth three years ago. He's also written other books, including a short story collection, including my favorite, Dillinger in Hollywood. I highly recommend this book, especially the title story. It's, it's an unforgettable story. This month, though, he's returned to the novel with Jamie McGilvery, The Renegade's Journey. It's an epic historical novel set in 18th century Scotland that the New York Times recently said was, quote, his best by some distance gets under the skin of this extraordinary time in a way few historic novels do. High praise indeed. Please welcome back to Santa Barbara, John Sales. So John, coming, if everybody. I could uh, start really quick, important question before yeah. we start. Who's going to win Best Picture this weekend? I have no what? idea. Yeah. <laughs> I, as, as a matter of fact, um, they let you vote for 10 pictures, mm -hmm. and I only had three that I nominated. So okay. I have no idea who's going to win, and I don't bet on those things. <laughs> good thing. It's a good thing. Yes. All right, take it away. Okay, I'm going to read a, a couple little sections from the book. Um... This first one, the two main characters in, in the novel are Jamie McGillivray, who is a young Scotsman who's dedicated to the Jacobite cause, who the people who are trying to bring back um, the Catholic kings um, to, to Scotland and get the English out of Scotland. Um, this is around 1745, 1746. Um, and Jenny, who... Jenny Ferguson is a young woman who's a, a barefoot clocking girl. A clocking is a small village. Uh, the poverty in Scotland, in the north of Scotland at that time, was really, really severe. So she's somebody who has grown up usually without shoes. Uh, a big deal for dinner is if you get to put a little cow's blood in your oatmeal for a little protein. And she's somebody who... Um, uh, is illiterate, but um, really, really smart and really, really curious about the world. So that when um, she is falsely accused of aiding and abetting the rebels and transported to the New World, um, she's the kind of person who, although she's in, chain, in chains on a prison boat and going down the Thames River, she's like, isn't that the Tower of London? Oh, wow, there's London Bridge. Oh, she's, she's almost like a tourist. Uh, has no idea what her fate will be, but she knew what her fate was back home, which was going to be married to some really poor farmer uh, who she probably didn't even know and, and in an arranged marriage. Um, what happens to her on her way to the, to the New World is just by a stroke of fortune, and this is something that I discovered when I was doing the, the research for the novel, is the boat that was carrying her, uh, when it got close to Jamaica, where they were going to offload all their prisoners, Jacobite prisoners, both men and women, um, the boat was taken by a French privateer, and the people were all liberated on the island of Martinique. Um, so all of a sudden, this, this dirt poor woman who's dying to see the world, there's French cooking, and there's mangoes, and uh, she gets a, a, a job uh, working in the kitchen of a French lieutenant, Lieutenant, um, and um, her, her immediate kind of companion is uh, uh, an enslaved young woman, um, African Martinican, um, who is also, as it turns out, the lieutenant's half-sister. 
Um, and one thing leads to another, and because surviving as a woman in those days was a very different thing than surviving as a man, uh, she has become the lieutenant's mistress at this point. Um, and he starts uh, his seduction of her when he starts hearing her speak the French that she's learning from the, the kitchen slaves, and he says, oh, you can't speak that, that awful French, and I'm going to teach you how to speak French, uh, and let's start with the body parts. <laughs> um, and so this, this is a, the scene where she uh, uh, has been his mistress for a little while, but this is her, her first public uh, exhibit, exhibition, and she's learned quite a bit of French, but doesn't like to speak it yet. The cotillion is held at the plantation house of one of the French lieutenant's cousins, the smell of burnt sugar overwhelming the fruitier scents that envelop the various dames du bal. Despite the dress of breathtaking blue, the bodice mashing her breasts upward till they are in danger of spilling out, despite the petticoats and the satin shoes, light as a whisper on her feet, Jenny cannot contrive to move like the other women. She has none of Amélie's talent for mimicry. The housekeeper herself, now in an orange and red douillette, fit for her new role, peeking through a side door with the other ladies' maids, their laughter plain to hear whenever the small orchestra, all black men in fine white livery, sees playing. Sois belle et mouette, the lieutenant has instructed her, holding a cautionary finger over his lips, declaring that her youth and the novelty of her situation will be found charming, but not her atrocious Creole polluted French or lack of savoir faire. So Jenny smiles as, ple as pleasantly as she can, making little attempts at curtsy curtsies as she is introduced to the other woman, attempting to be beautiful and mute, feigning a total lack of com comprehension when they voice their evaluations while looking her in the eye. Only a kitchen servant, they say, but white women are in such sort of supply. It is widely known that the Scots never wear undergarments, they say, neither the men nor the women. She may be his chouchou fallery at the moment, they say, but he'll soon drift back to his negresse, like all the other weak and aimless men on this island. Jenny remains blank as they gossip, learning that in this ballroom full of finely dressed grand blanc, there are those who were born in France and those who were not. And among the latter, there are those who have been to France and those who have not. And that this seems to matter a great deal. The women are kind enough to Jenny, who, having never been to France or ever wishing to go there, is no threat to any of them. In the first part of the evening, the men and women remain separate from each other, a deeper pitch and a veil of smoke on the male side of the room with much speculation about what the English might be up to and the fickle market for sugarcane. While in the female half, there is gossip not only local, but directly, if tardily, from the corridors of Versailles. The latest presumptions of Madame de Pompadour and the tragedy of the poor Spanish Dauphine, dead within days of delivering her first royal child, a girl, alas, compete with the story of Ghislaine Leandre standing brazenly by the punch bowl in her bay's chiffon after her affair with an affluent smuggler from Saint-Pierre who is rumored to be a quarteron. Halfway through the evening, Jenny realizes that she is not wearing the, the dress so much as carrying it around to be admired and that very little of the accoutrement and the behavior around her is without calculation. Though the participants are neither as drunken nor as likely to cross swords with each other as those at a Highland Cayley, this is a battleground. Each hairstyle, beauty patch, fleck of guilt, or turn of phrase a sortie with coveted social territory to be won or lost. It is the dancing that saves the night for her. Jenny always nimble when there is a piper to be heard and no Kirk elders within earshot. The steps are not difficult to learn, whether minuet, gavotte, or even the more complicated ring dances, Jenny moving with the music and following the gentleman's guidance. And the lieutenant is pleased by how many of the officers and planters 
wish to lead her onto the floor. She wonders at the musicians, if these black men have other duties in the daytime, or if their skill with an instrument has saved them from the cane. If so, she vows to be like them, a performer with a perpetual smile, and in the carriage returning through the burnt sugar night, the lieutenant holds her hand and compliments Jenny on her comportment. Tu fais une très belle figure, he says, petting her. Très belle. Later, Amélie, eyes ablaze with excitement and still in her new gown, slips in to sit at the edge of Jenny's bed. Ça va, Moshe? she says, telling Jenny how good this could be for both of them, that the lieutenant seems enchanted with her, that once the hook is set, a wise fisherman knows how to coax even the most recalcitrant poisson into the boat. Tells her that if she is careful, if she can learn to read the man correctly, she will be settled for life, comme une vraie maîtresse blanche. While Jenny sits on the edge of the bed in blue silk, staring past her lady's maid to the mirror fixed on the wall, searching for the barefoot clocking girl who crushed a man's skull with a grindstone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the second piece is uh, is with Jamie, and Jamie doesn't get as lucky um, to have his boat taken by a French privateer. Um, he's uh, uh, involved enough in the in the um, the rebellion that uh, he is um, taken to the point where he's standing on a platform with a rope around his neck, um, uh, peeing in his pants before they say, "Oh." We were just joking, we're not gonna hang you. We're gonna transport you to the new world. Uh, but this whole process has taken several years and the food is not very good and the treatment is not very good and the various prisons that he's held in. Um, and eventually he is sentenced to um, uh, basically slavery, servitude for the term of his natural life, but in the new world. And so he's being transported there and uh, the process that they use for that is that you were basically um, given to the ship's captain. He owned you until he docked wherever he docked. In this case, uh, it's uh, you know on a river down from the Chesapeake Bay in what's now Maryland. Um, and then he can do whatever he wants with you, sell you, give you away, whatever, uh, and you belong to that person. Um, so uh, the only other thing I think you know, there's a character named uh, Fergal McGregor, uh, who is, uh, you've met before in the book, uh, who's just this huge, huge, scary Highlander uh, who's gone pretty crazy because at one point during his captivity uh, for punishment, he was shackled face to face with a corpse for about a week. And uh, he's pretty gone. <laughs> it is early afternoon when there is a shout and a crude dock appears reaching out into the water ahead, and the gildart drags anchor to moor a stone's fling from the shore. A trio of rowboats pull out to greet them, each with a black man rowing and two well-dressed white men looking forward on the seats. Keach and three of the other sailors have pulled up the mats and now arrange the convicts into a large semicircle, dragging chains and fastening them again through the deck bolts. That's your master's coming, says Keach, on his knees dealing with the irons. You'll do well to keep your tongues in your teeth and your eyes on your future. Mm. Captain Holmes greets the planters, solid men in buff and gray coats without lace or periwigs, and they retire to his cabin for a friendly drop. The Scotsmen are left standing under the sun of late July, sweat beginning to run down their foreheads, eyes blinking at the sting. Stay as you are, calls Horner, striding before them. We'll be underway soon enough. Jamie watches a seahawk flapping overhead, wings laboring as it carries a large fish. I sheft it in their claws somehow, he says to Lachlan beside him, afore they left book, so the head of the fishy is always held forward. <laughs> and keep where they're gone to, ah, which is doing a hatchling's gullet. But first, they get to fly. All we got is salt junk and sea biscuit and two months in the bilge water. Ah, but 
They're not going to eat us, Jamie. Says you. Horner does most of the talking when it begins. Standing on an overturned wash bucket, singing praises and giving directions to the planters as they approach and examine the shackled men. Chests and arms are thumped, mouths pried open and peered into, a sailor with a handspike shadowing each of the buyers to ensure an uneventful perusal of the cargo. That's Thomas Lang you've got there. Twas a mine laborer in Aberdeen. And if it's a strong back you're seeking, I have an offer, eight pounds sterling. Let's be serious, gentlemen. There we are, nine and six, but still it's pure theft for this lad. I see ten, ten. Do we have a gentleman to top it? Ten and five, that's reasonable. You'll not find the luck of him elsewhere, in mint condition from the voyage and ready to lay his shoulder to whatever you please. Ten and five, going once, twice. They'll pay in tobacco, observes Keach, standing at a tall barrel behind Jamie Lachlan, Aeneas Cameron, and Big Fergal, who are chained together. A few months from now, what goes to acquire your sorry hides will be thumbed up the Duke of Cumberland's beak and sneezed out in the royal palace. George Bailey as was a bonnet maker in Dundee, but I'm certain he will turn his hand to whatever you have a need for. Feed him a bit of meal, let him find his land legs, and he'll serve you well. A good steady man, guaranteed not to turn rabbit on you. And look at the head of hair on the man, healthy as a hound. The planters come near, but Fergal's gaze, fierce and steady into their eyes, drives them away. As men are sold and unshackled, they are led to Keach, who has been turning a long iron in a lit brazier. Right hand on the barrel head, he says to each, then applies the hot tip of the iron to a spot between the thumb and forefinger. Jamie smells burning flesh. Only a precaution to flight, says Keach. Be grateful it's not on your cheek. The branded man has then stepped forward to another barrel where Captain Holmes spreads his indenture out to be signed over to the new owner. John Lucky there, that's a fisherman in his former life, and Lucky's the man that buys him. Got all of his teeth and two strong arms, and no stranger to the water, which will serve you well in this swamp-ridden neck of the woods. What do I hear for this fine specimen of a Scotsman? The bidding starts at nine pounds sterling, gentlemen. Let's not be coy. The first to leave are a pair of buyers who seem to have a secret agreement with Captain Holmes and the purser exchanging nods as certain of the prisoners are pulled out from the line. They each take seven men who are lowered down into the waiting rowboats. All of them Catholics, says Lachlan. You're sure of that? I've watched them pray together, and the captain does well. They maun be free men before the sun sets. Mm. Uh, mere power to them, if it's true. Tis the Roman Pope, Lachlan assures Jamie with a wink. He casts a long shadow. <laughs> Most of the men have been chosen, branded, and legally bonded before a final rowboat arrives. On it are a man introduced as Colonel Thomas Lee, who is the local magistrate, along with two buckskins, men in leathern trues and homespun shirts, each carrying a rifle. Last aboard is a final planter, a tall, gaunt man with a bloodshot eyes and stubble on his face furious to have arrived after the best men have been spoken for. This one plants himself in front of Jamie's group as the colonel joins Captain Holmes, who has been arguing with Alexander Stewart. This one won't sign, says Holmes. The colonel, broad-shouldered and graying at the temples, takes a slow walk around the prisoner, examining him from head to toe. Speak English? I do. You understand that you've been sold, I don't accept it. <laughs> accept it or not. You've got only two choices here. Go peaceably with your new owner or remain bonded to Captain Holmes here. In which case, he will send you back into the hold, which I can smell has just had the vinegar and fire treatment, and be returned to Liverpool, where you will be hanged upon arrival. Stuart's face flushes red, his cuffed hands beginning to tremble. But, as you'll no longer be valuable cargo, the captain is under no obligation to his employer to feed or care for you in any way. You won't make the voyage, my friend. Stuart, without looking at either man, bends to lift the pen and awkwardly sign the indenture papers. That is, 
Fergal McGregor before you, calls Horner as he sees where the new planter is looking. A Highlands crofter and cattle thief. We're three men or one mule if you'll hitch him to a plow. Don't be daunted by his fierce aspect. The Scotch can be broken to service by I'm well aware of what a Scotsman might do, corrects the gaunt planter without lifting his fiery gaze from Fergal's. I'll give you 40 pound and cellar for the lot of them. He indicates the four men chained together. Horner looks to the captain, who sighs and nods. Sold then, sold to, may I inquire, Crozier, says the gaunt planter. Jock Crozier of the Georgia colony. Jamie is branded first, holding his own wrist steady on the barrel head with his left hand. There is a sharp pain, a tiny sizzling sound, and then a B-shaped welt rising up. There you are, lad, says Keach. It hurts less if you don't fight it. When it is Fergal's turn, though, he begins to fight, cursing an erse and struggling with three of the burliest of the ship's crew. They have him down, a foot to the back of his neck, when Crozier kneels to look him in the eye and speak quietly, miming the actions with his hands. You'll have it, mark it, he says, or I'll have it cut off. Fergal opens his hand, and Keach applies the red-hot iron. They were loaded into two boats, Cameron and Fergal crammed in with Colonel Lee and the buckskins, while Jamie and Lachlan, hands still bound, ride with Jock Crozier as his black man rose. The planter catches Jamie looking at the African, who has symmetri symmetrical markings scarred into each cheek. I call Latin, Bunny Prince Charlie, grins Crozier. <coughs> you do well not to vex him. <laughs> So that's in the first third of the book, uh, <laughs> and uh, eventually they get to the new uh, new world and get involved with uh, uh, Lenny Lenape Indians, who we know as the Delaware Indians, and uh, what we call the French and Indian War. When's the miniseries going to be seen? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. I do have a question about, um, this is set in mid-18th century Scotland, 1746. 45, 46 to be exact. The Battle of Culloden. If you can tell everybody what the Battle of Culloden and the significance of that battle was in terms of Scottish history. Yeah, the, the, uh, about 1810, uh, by bribing and threatening a lot of people, uh, the English made Scotland part of a union. So it was the three crowns uh, were put together. And uh, a lot of Scotland we're not crazy about this. Some of them were supporters of the, of the Stuart kings uh, mm -hmm. who were in um, exile first in France and then eventually in Italy. Um, and there was an uprising in uh, 1750 and Jamie's family lost their land by backing the wrong side and being rebels. And so he and his brother are raised to get it back. Mm -hmm. So when the 45 comes around- no, not 1750. 1715 and then in, 15, when the fort yeah. 15 Sorry. and when the 45 comes around uh, that's because the son of the exiled Stuart King Bunny Prince Charlie who's yeah. about 20 years old and he's this skinny kid and he mostly speaks Italian uh, decides I know what I'll do I'll go to northern Scotland with a handful of men and everybody will rally around me and will defeat the English and drive them back and maybe even take over London and I'll be the king of the three crowns. Um, it, they do very well actually at first. They get a lot of people, a lot of the clans come out for them. Not all of them because some of them had already made their deal with uh, the English. Um, they get down within about 60 miles of London mm. and then the, the English bring a lot of their troops who are fighting in, a, in the War of the Austrian se se Secession over in Europe uh, come back and they start to get pushed back, 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 yeah. all the way up to Inverness in the north of Scotland. And there's this final battle um, where the Duke of Cumberland, who is like the third son of King George, uh, leading the English, defeat the Scots um, in this battle on this great big flat plain in the mm. pouring rain, terrible terrain for a battle, especially for the Scots because their main. Um, 
tactic is to start playing the pipes and screaming and running toward the other one with these claymores, which weigh like two baseball bats, um, and uh, try to overrun them. And there's just too much ground between them. And they just get mowed down on the way. Um, and that, that was pretty much the end of the story for the Scots Rebellion. And the uh, English um, decide, okay, some of these people will hang, some will behead if they're, they're royals, mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're lords, um, and some will just get rid of um, and transport them to the New World. And the ones we don't, um, from now on, you can't speak Erse, which is Scots Gaelic. You can't wear plaid. You can't play the pipes. Oh, yeah. And um, there were, I'm sure there were people, even in Scotland, who said, well, the pipe's okay, <laughs> um, but, especially indoors. But um, that lasted pretty much until just before the end of this book, where we're approaching the Battle of Quebec mm -hmm. about 13, 14 years later, mm -hmm. and uh, General Wolfe has this idea of, we need more troops and we need shock troops. Well, what about those Scots Highlanders? Um, what if we made a deal with them where they could play the pipes, they could wear their, their plaid, they could speak their stupid language if they want, if they fight for us, but never on British soil. Mm -hmm. And so they become now the shock troops, you know, for the empire. Okay. Along the lines of uh, historical novels, there's a fine line between uh, even refashioning history or just kind of glossing over history, or the, on the other end, there's there's, you're just overwrought with facts. But what I liked about what you wrote is the fact that you can insert historical things in there within the context of the story. And I was wondering how much of a challenge that was for you. Well, the, the nice thing, th this, um, this story kind of landed in my lap. Uh, over 20 years ago, the Scots actor Robert Carlyle, who uh -huh. I did not know, uh, I had been recommended to him. He called me up and said... Uh, well, I'm, on a, I'm in Hawaii on a movie set, but I have this idea that would be cool for a movie about a Highlander who's transported to the New World and he gets involved in the Indians. And I liked it so much, I wrote a screenplay. And then uh, Maggie and I got to uh, tour the Highlands with Robert Carlyle, which was a lot wow. of fun. Um, <laughs> and doors opened, as you can imagine. And then we, we scouted a lot of the other places in the New World in Canada and, and the States that uh, appear in the book. Uh, and we can never raise the money to make the, the movie out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I had done quite a bit of research at that point, and what I, I hung it all on was the actual history mm -hmm. and the dates of the actual history, you know, and, and what led to, you know, this, this proxy war that we call the French and Indian War, mm -hmm. uh, when, when the, the English and the French were just itching to, to fight each other, mm -hmm. and they needed not much of a precedent to do yes. it. Um, when I started working on the novel some 20 years later, um, I was able to go deeper into the, to the research. And what I find generally when I'm writing history is that the real history is more interesting than what you can make up. And it's certainly easier than making stuff up, because there it is. Um, so you have this, this framework, and then you have your characters, and you say, OK, uh, Jenny's on a ship. How am I going to get her to cross paths with Jamie again in the New World? Um, and then I, I went and I found the logs of a bunch of these. They were basically slave ships that would also, for a fee, transport prisoners to the New World. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them said, oh, geez, they, they didn't make it to Jamaica to put people out into the cane fields. Uh, they were taken by a, a, you know, a French privateer and released on the island of Martinique. And I said, well, Jamie's, <laughs> you know, Jenny's got to go to Martinique. And, yeah. If she's there, she's going to have to meet a French lieutenant. I mean, that's <laughs> a rule in fiction of any sort. Um, and then, of course, the French lieutenant, things are going very, very well. And one day in the book, he, and which happened to some of the troops down there, he says, c'est un désastre. And she said, what's the, the matter? He said, I've just been you know, transferred to the icebox. I have to, we have to go to Canada. Canada. Yeah, and she's yeah. just gotten you know, like her sandals and... <laughs> she, she likes the food and everything, and the next thing they know, they're in Canada in the middle of the winter. So you're saying that history actually plotted the path of your character? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you, you kind of know where you want them to end up, but then you find what's going to, what's going to be able to carry them there, and why would they end up in the same places at the same time. 
And, and quite honestly, I, 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 in my other historical novels, um, I've been really, really, really close to, you know, if I'm talking about the, you know, the, the, you know, the 25th Infantry in the Spanish-American and Philippine-American uh, War, I get the, you know, the regimental history, and I know what they did every day. And, and I find good story stuff there. Wow. Two more questions, and I'll open it up. Um, speaking of history, you actually insert historical figures in your novel, and they play somewhat of a part. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say, like, George Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't insert them. Yeah, they, there were so many fewer people around in 1740 <laughs> to 50 that uh, if you're hanging out and you're getting involved in, in you know, um, frontier politics, you're going to run into George Washington. He was like almost my height. He was, you know, in those days, a giant, I mean, several times in the book I have him kind of to get into somebody's cabin or into a longhouse or something like that. He was too tall. Uh, you were going to run into, if you were in, in what's now Pennsylvania, you would have heard of Shingus the Terrible, you know, mm -hmm. who was yeah. this this chief that the English had, you know, kind of said, you're a chief, mm -hmm. and he didn't especially want the job, and then they were sorry about it later. <laughs> uh, if you're in, in uh, London in that era, you're going to run into uh, Thomas Fielding, you know, who wrote Tom Jones, because he was a big anti-Jacobite, you know, uh, mm -hmm. satirist. You're going to run into Ho Hogarth, mm -hmm. who's the most famous caricaturist of the day. Mm -hmm. And and Lord Lovett, who uh, is in the first third of the book, is this notorious character who was the last British lord ever to be beheaded. Um, okay. And he deserved it. Um, <laughs> and had probably escaped it three or four times before that. But he's also really fun to hang out with. Wow. <laughs> so you're saying it's like it's so close quarters and so few people. It's like being in Hollywood. Right? A, a little bit, yeah. It's, it's, there's, you know, El Mundo es un panuelo. The, the world is a handkerchief. You're going to yeah. run into some of the same people. Okay. My last question is, somebody did mention adaptation, and it's kind of a reverse. You started with a film, but then you ended up with a book. But mm -hmm. I could see with the visuals that you provided, it can be something such as a series over two to three years, like a Game of Thrones type of thing? Or... You know, that's up to other people besides me who mm -hmm. would have to pay for it. Um, <laughs> I, I got to do um, uh, a Zoom uh, thing yesterday with Diana Gobbledone, who wrote all the Outlander oh, books, yeah. and which got made into a very successful series. And I think she's going to write a... She's working on the 10th and maybe final uh, <laughs> book of that series, yeah. and she also works on the, on the TV show. And... Um, when they're done, certainly there'll be a lot of costumes left over. <laughs> so it might be a little cheaper to make. <laughs> it's not up to me. Let's open it up to our audience questions. Are you going to read the Audible book? No, I don't think I, I, you know, so far they haven't asked me to, and I don't know if they're going to make one. Um, my Scots accent's getting a little bit better. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would assume that it would be better to have, you know, my ideal thing is to have somebody with a, a real Scots accent do Jamie and then a woman do the Jenny chapters. Um, it'd just be a, less work for them to do it. Um, and you know, if you've listened to audiobooks, um, the reader makes a huge difference. Um, we drove out to the West Coast from Connecticut and... Uh, we got to listen to John Le Carre's memoirs, and I almost never recommend listening to a book rather than reading it. It's incredible. He's such a good rock on tour. He's got a great ear for all the accents that he does, and he has such an interesting life that it just, oh, you have to spend hours and hours with this guy who passed a couple of years ago. You gotta put yourself in there, or oh, yeah, at maybe. least the movie. <laughs> well, some backwoods guy. I can do as, as Ring Lardner goes, you were Ring Lardner. Yeah, you well, out. <laughs> you know, actually, after I did that, um, I Ring Lardner Jr. came to the set one day, uh -huh. and uh, he saw me do a scene, and I said, "So, what is it like seeing somebody play your father?" He said, "Uncomfortably familiar," <laughs> which I took as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how long did it take you to write this? Um, because it started as a screenplay and I did quite a bit of the research 20 years earlier, uh, once I decided to make a, a, a novel, it took about um, one COVID year to write it, uh, then about one year to find a publisher, and then now because the supply chain for books is really bad for like paper and ink, 
It mm -hmm. took like a year and a half to get it out. So this is oh, something yeah. that I, I finished about two and a half years ago, but yeah. about a year of writing. I have this rule when I'm writing a historical thing that um, I can only do one week of research and then I have to sit down and write some fiction. Um, wow. Research is so, you know, it, it's just so seductive. It's so much fun. You, you know, all of a sudden, you know, how did I get to Polynesia? You know, <laughs> my characters aren't going there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, but you spent two days reading really interesting stuff. So I, I tend to, 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 you know, this is the section I'm writing. What do I need to know to even start? And I'll do like a week of research and then I'll write the thing. And then I'll have, you know, little question marks mostly detailed stuff that I'll, I'll clean up later, and then I move on to the next section. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. Could you uh, just tell us a little bit more about your approach to the research? It's like you've got the setting and, and, mm -hmm. the, and the time period. Where do you begin? To well, you, you, you begin with the, the big broad strokes of the stuff, and, and you know, I, I kind of write a thing of what happened in what year. Okay, and so what are the politics? For instance, the first thing is, well, how long did they hold on to these people before they transported them? It was several years, and a lot of people died on both prison ships and in prisons. Jamie, at one point, is in the same um, debtor's prison that um, Dickens' father was held in, you know, and that has a certain thing. It, they were held in the, this thing called the toll booth in, in Edinburgh. So I say, oh, he's going to be in Edinburgh for almost a year in this in this. I know, you know, and I read about what did the rooms look like. Well, Jamie would have been there as a because he was a law student, and that's where you went for the law, and then so he actually knows the city. So he's as he's being marched in, mm -hmm. and so details accumulate. Um, he, when he would have been there, there was a a, a famous riot um, where um, a, a guy who was basically a local police guy um, had his troops turn and fire on an unruly mob during a public execution, and then he was thrown into jail, and he was pulled out of the toll booth and lynched, and Jamie would have been there. And so I included that. Um, you know, so, so it kind of starts to spread a little bit, um, but then it's just kind of, you have to, okay, what did people eat then? What was available for what class of people? Um, you know, one great thing, Lord Lovett is this guy, if you've seen, uh, Hogarth did a famous drawing of him, and he's as wide, literally as wide as he is tall. <laughs> His head's like a big jack-o'-lantern. And uh, at, at Castle Doney, his, his, you know, the clan, you know, castle, um, the chairs for he and his friends who we would invite, um, the arms had these, these iron rings under them so that the ghillies could put poles through them and carry their drunken lairds to their beds because they would drink until they passed out in their chairs. Mm -hmm. you know? so that kind of stuff accumulates. Um, weaponry, you have to know how the weaponry worked. I had to do a lot of research on the ships. You Does know, this what, start on the, on the internet, basically, or do you seek out libraries? You know, or? I don't believe anything I read on the internet, right. but you can exactly. find the books that you have to, to track down on the internet. Uh, one nice um, thing that's happened is on a couple of my books, I've run into this thing where there's only two copies of a certain book left. You know, for, for uh, Moment in the Sun, there was this one, you know, book written in Spanish uh, by a Spaniard at the time when, um, you know, we took over Manila Bay during the Philippine-American War. Two copies existed. One was in Madrid, the other was in the United States, and it cost $1,000. I wasn't about to buy that, and then I discovered, oh, somebody scanned that somewhere, wow. and for seven dollars, and it has like dead mosquitoes on the pages <laughs> that they scanned as well. So, so yeah. more and more is available than, than there used to be. Occasionally, you'll have to go to a library where there, there's something, but very often now you can track down a book and order it. And and uh, while I was writing this, I got a lot of mail. It's like, oh, somebody sent me a book. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder who paid for it. <laughs> Just uh, really quick, are you thinking of writing a book, Chris? No. Oh, come no. on. <laughs> Chris no, no, is no, telling. No, no, no. Yeah, he's a no. filmmaker. Yeah. You do one of those as told to books. Yes, then you exactly. Know what <laughs> I'm waiting, Chris. Any other questions? How can we see Mate One? How can we see Mate One? Uh, Mate One, Miha. The Criterion channel is unfortunately the only place for you to watch oh, it. Right now. 
Which bank? Yes. The TF. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're good to support the Criterion Channel. Yeah. yeah. Smarter than yeah. many. Um, but what, what happens with uh, many of our movies, because they were um, made independently and distributed by smaller companies, those companies go out of business, their library is sold to another company, that company goes out of business. So, and things tend to drift to MGM and their, their library, and they, you call them up and you say, you own our movie, and they say, no, we don't. And it may take you half a year for them to say, oh, guess what, actually we do. So we're now working with a lawyer to invoking the 1978 copyright law, which means that 35 years after the original assignment of rights, the rights upon notice by the author return to the author. The studios okay. don't like it. Yeah. So do you yeah. know where the negative is in the soundtrack? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. beautifully okay. taken care it, it's, of. It's just not on a streaming service right now it's other than... It's a like commercial. Mm -hmm. High school stuff. So you can't stream it on Criterion. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, on Criterion you could say, and then we did a whole, you know, talk track and yeah. got James Earl Jones to talk and some of the other actors oh, who were in it. And so it's nice. John, how close was the original screenplay that you mm -hmm. stopped working on or took a break from mm -hmm. to the final book? Were there a lot of changes or the same character? Mostly just things that were added. The biggest change was that um, Jenny was a very small character in the screenplay. And once I discovered that thing that she, you know, had had been, you know, could have been um, freed, you know, on the island of Martinique, I said, well, I've got to do her her story. And so she's now, you know, a third or more of the book. So that's the biggest change. Um, very little that's in the screenplay is not in the book. Um, but, you know, a screenplay that was for a two-hour movie, maybe a two-hour and ten-minute movie. So there are bigger time jumps in that, and you just spend more time with, you know, every scene and and and, and every kind of sequence um, in the book. So going from the screenplay to the book, I mean, this is seven hundred pages, which is two thirds of the size of a Moment in the Sun. Yeah. <laughs> Not to give you a beautiful bit. Yeah. That's the big stuff. The, the, yeah, the big expansion. How were you able to do that? Well, what, one advantage you have now, because I do most of my writing on a computer, is you don't see a pile of paper getting higher and higher. <laughs> so I don't count <laughs> until I'm done. And I, I tend to write, you know, okay, I'm going to do a couple hundred pages, and then I'll start a new file, and I'll do, you know, until it gets to that big. So I, I, I literally, you know, don't know until I feel like this is done. And I say, okay, I'll count now. Um, with A Moment in the Sun, I had this strange thing happen. I had not written a novel in a long time. And I sent it out with uh, my, my literary agent. And he said, uh, well, you know, people are starting to, to, to worry about the length. And I thought, eh, that's not that long. And then I realized, oh, I forgot to double space it. <laughs> so I thought it was a 500 page <laughs> It was not a 500 page um, But yeah, it's, you know, uh, you know, when, when you're doing something of that length, you know, I knew at the beginning it's going to start at Culloden and end in Quebec. That's mm -hmm. 13 years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that happens. Yeah. And, you know, Jamie is a linguist. You know, when we meet him, he speaks, you know, English, Scots, Scots, Gaelic, mm -hmm. um, French, some Latin. And then he learns Lenny Lenape. Well, it takes a while to learn a new language. Mm -hmm. So he's he's basically a slave of the Lenny Lenape for several years, you know. And so I may do that in 30 pages, but it, you you got to feel like there's some time that has passed there. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it, it's you. I, I I use this example of I finally a couple of years ago actually read. Uh, Moby Dick, and not just the classic comic book version. <laughs> um, and um, I really liked it, but there are chapters where it's just like he spends a, a long chapter on on how to render whale fat. Yeah, and it doesn't advance the plot, but you know, I felt like, well, I've been on this ship for long enough. I want to know how do we do this if we actually catch a whale. Yeah. And it made total sense that, that in a book that size, you could wander around it a, a little bit. Interesting. We have one yeah, more question. Do you have goals for how much you want to get done in a day? And no, I, I don't do that. I, I do tend to not like to stop uh, late at night at the end of a chapter. Uh -huh. I would prefer to have, 
something that I have and I'll write some notes if I have some ideas. But it's great to have something where you know, kind of know what you're going to do tomorrow. Um, and so um, that's about the only thing to do. But there's days when I, I, I write for an hour in the morning and then I do other stuff. And then there's days where I just kind of, that's all I do. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, I try to get up just, you know, so I, I don't get a bad back every half hour and walk around the block or something. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky in that I'm, I'm a writer who I may be writing other things at the same time. And that um, it's like two minutes of reading it. Oh, this world. You know, exactly. I'm not in the future anymore. I'm not in the old west. Mm -hmm. I'm in Scotland in 1747. Mm -hmm. Do you already have plans to create a film with this? I, I don't have plans. I had plans 20 years ago, and we couldn't raise the money. Basically, somebody would have to approach us. And I would say that just the way that economics work, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be a film. They would they would say, this is a miniseries. Oh. Um, if you're going to make all those props and costumes and stuff like that, to, you, you want to amortize it over many, many hours, mm -hmm. not just two where if you have a bad opening weekend, <laughs> it's all lost. Thank you. Last yes. question. What are you working on now? What I'm working on now is, is actually yet another screenplay that I wrote years ago that, that we never were able to raise the money for. I could write until I'm 100 doing that because I have <laughs> written so many screenplays that haven't been made. Uh, this one is called um, To Save the Man, and it's set at the Carlisle Indian School in 1890 and 91, which are the years of the ghost dance and the Wounded Knee Massacre. Wow. And um, Captain Pratt, who in his day was a progressive, um, his philosophy was um, these Indian kids are just as smart as anybody else. The only thing that's holding them back is their culture. Um, Native Americans were down to about a quarter of a million people from disease and war and being thrown onto these reservations and shortchanged on the, the food and, and money they were supposed to be given according to their treaties. Um, and his idea was, we're going to take them sometimes kicking and scream, screaming, sometimes you know, um, eager to come from all over the country. So tribe, people from tribes that never would have met before met there, which was the, one of the pluses mm -hmm. about the place. Um, and we're going to make sure they have nobody in their, their room who speaks their language. If we catch them speaking their language, they will be punished. Um, and to save the man, we must kill the Indian. Um, so it's a pretty heavy time, even yeah. in the history of that school, which is kind of pretty heavy history for all of us to deal with right now. This is written for uh, Jim Thorpe, right? Yeah. The, yeah, Jim Thorpe didn't show up until about... 1906, mm -hmm. and he was there a couple of years before he even started playing sports seriously. And uh, I, I think he his last season playing for them was 1912. Um, so the, these are, this is a mix of Indians who have, you know, they've been around white people for generations, and mm -hmm. some of them speak perfect English, mm -hmm. and they go there just because it's got, it looks like it's a better education than they can get back on the mm -hmm. reservation. Um, and then kids who were about to kill their first buffalo and oh. speak no English at all. And they're taught, you know, the first day their hair is cut off, which back home that means your parents have died. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're told, we catch you speaking your language, you're in the cooler. So we'll work on that a little bit, but right now you should enjoy the fruits yeah. of labor. And I am happy to sign anything oh, okay. you got that you need signing. Once uh, again, Let's welcome and thank John We'll line up right here. And I need some writing implements. Yeah, I'll get you that. And for Scully Wharf Law School. Yeah, so. just, just. Congratulations. I was an assistant. L-I-S-A. You wouldn't.